Okay, should we start? Yeah. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to Math 206B, which is going to be about cluster algebras. By the way, can you hear me and see the screen? Okay, cool. Uh, all right, yeah. So thanks for tuning in. And uh, so this is a topics class, uh, which is going to be a lot of it is going to be about some kind of recent results. Let me try to first cover some logistics of how it's going to work. Um, so, uh, yeah, I guess first of all, if there is, um, first of all, I haven't uh, written this on the class website, but basically what we're going to do is going to be some sort of a mixed, mixed classroom with some, uh, yeah, anyway, so every Monday, there's going to be no lecture, no lectures, no live lectures on Mondays. And, and instead of that, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pre-record a video on the weekend, pre-recorded video. Uh, on the weekend, which I'm going to send you and then so uh, it's going to be more like so the live lectures are going to be more interactive and where I mean it's kind of uh, I'm going to ask you questions and then you're going to all uh, respond and etc and so but for the pre-recorded lectures I'm going to try to cover maybe some of you have different backgrounds so I'm going to try to cover slowly some backgrounds if you don't like how boring it is you can fast forward and twice the speed or whatever and if you if on the other hand it's getting a little hard then you can pause all the usual stuff and yeah but on the live clearly this monday is an exception we're doing a live lecture today but next week there's going to be no live lecture on monday uh, second of all um, let's talk about the grading so the grading is going to be based on homeworks primarily. So 95% are going to be just homeworks, which uh, you're going to submit through, this is going to be through grade scope. I'm going to set it up today, hopefully, and you're going to get an email about that. So. Um, that's 95% and the other 5%, uh, which is something pandemic related, is going to be uh, class participations. Class participation. participation. And what do I mean by that? Uh, well, I mean, it's kind of, it's not like too serious, but it's more to encourage you to interact. You know, you should, yeah, let me write it down. Uh, you should participate, well, first of all, participate in lectures. Um, if you're in different time zone or something like this, please, please send me an email and I'm go always going to accommodate every kind of circumstances. But uh, if, if you can, then please, you know, turn on the camera, uh, give me all the comments, like interrupt me at all times in the chat or just kind of turn on your mic and just, uh, yeah, this is supposed to be an interactive class and I'm, I'm hoping you will participate a lot. So engage in lectures and there's also, if you're uh, kind of in addition or instead you can uh, write me lots of emails just, you know, send me an email, introduce yourself, what are your hobbies, what's your favorite math problem, whatever. Uh, I want to get to know everybody, and since we're in a pandemic, please, you know, we're going to have to adjust a little bit, and in particular, uh, email is a good way to do that. And so one other, uh, one other thing I want to mention is that uh, I would very much appreciate if you could, there's going to be a book, right? So here's a 
book on the left uh, by Lynn Williams and Zelensky, Introduction to Cluster Algebras. It's a it's a it's an ongoing pro process. So it, several chapters are online. More chapters have been written as we speak right now. And so the authors are going to appreciate if you could actually, when while you're reading the book, if you can see any typos or any kind of exercises that are not well posed, please feel free to let me know, or you can write directly to the authors. Uh, look for typos in the book. Yeah, so some parts of the class are going to be based on the book, and some other parts are going to be just papers or, or some kind of very recent papers. So it's going to be a mix of several things. And uh, right, so and the next point is that the uh, lectures are going to be recorded so that you could return to them return them later and or if you're in different time zones you can watch them separately and one important point is that the audience audience is not recorded so i have some kind of software for gamers that records myself and my screen but doesn't record any of you guys n n none of your voices or chats so please feel free to as I said, interrupt me as much as you want, and none of that is going to be on YouTube. Okay, I think that's that's it for, yeah. No, <laughs> no, but I had to learn how to use one of those. Yeah, but thanks for the question. Yeah, that's uh, that's good. All right, so that's it for logistics. Let me stop and ask if there is any other questions about this. Yeah, I'll try either like add an annotation to the video or you know, I'll, I'll try to repeat the questions, but I'm going to forget at some point. So yeah, uh, please remind me if I, if I do. Yeah, if, if I forget, I'll try to add an annotation. Any other questions? All right, cool. Uh, Okay, let me now try to do some math today. And so I'm not going to give you a definition of a cluster algebra for a while. It's a little bit over the top, so instead I'm going to spend maybe a lecture or two trying to discuss the uh, properties and examples of cluster algebras. And yeah, so by the way, uh, as you can see over here is some kind of a, you know, like, like a news program, some kind of ticker or whatever, which is going to, so usually there are several blackboards and you can, you can look at the previous blackboard to kind of remind yourself uh, what I wrote a while before, but uh, this screen is very tiny. So hopefully what's going to appear here is going to be, um, is going to duplicate what I'm writing here, but uh, in a nicer handwriting than I do. So yeah, if you forget any formula, hopefully it's going to be on the left as well. Um, okay. Now, um, okay. So the the kind the whole point of cluster algebras is that it it's a concept that captures some very surprising and interesting behavior that shows up in a lot of places. So the cluster algebras were introduced by Fomin and Zelovinsky, and when they introduced them originally, they didn't really anticipate s such an explosion of research in this area. And what happened was that the kind of the properties of cluster algebras showed up everywhere in different uh, subfields of mathematics and then, or physics, like string theory or quantum groups, equivalent representations, knot theory, uh, yeah, all kinds of stuff. And then all those researchers started to interact with the cluster algebra people. And so 
the whole field kind of grew and now it's like thousands of papers uh, which uh, yeah so it's it's a pretty big field right now uh, but the whole reason was that the there are some very recognizable properties of cluster algebras and so what i'm going to try to do is i'm going to demonstrate the properties first and then we're going to slowly come to the concept of a cluster algebra and so let me start by um, okay let's let's do an example first so let me consider the following sequence it's going to be a sequence of numbers x0, x1, x2, etc., which is going to be defined by a recurrence relation. xn plus 4 is equal to xn plus 1 times xn plus 3 plus xn plus 2 squared divided by xn. This is for n greater than or equal to 4, oh sorry, greater than or equal to 0, and then the initial conditions are going to be just x0 equal to 1, x1 equal to 1, x2 equal to 1, and x3 equal to 1. And so what we're going to do is, uh, well, we're going to use our calculators or our brains to compute the next several values, and then I want you to look for some surprising property of the sequence. Some property that, if I tell you, you're going to obviously see that, that it holds, but it's going to be very difficult to prove. Right, so, for example, if I compute x4, it's going to be, well, using this formula, it's going to be like 1 times 1 plus 1 divided by 1. Oops, 1 times 1 plus 1 divided by 1, that's a2. Right. And so, and the next one, yeah, let me do the first couple myself and then I'm going to ask you guys to continue. So x5 is like 1 times 2 plus 1 squared over 1. Uh, 1 times 2 plus 1 squared, yeah this is supposed to be squared over 1. So that's a 3. Right, so let me, so the formula you can you can see it's here if, if it's not on the screen. Okay, now what about x6? Can you tell me what it's going to be? Or write in the chat, 7. Nice. Right, so that's correct. 1 times 3 plus 2 squared over 1. That is, okay, let me write down, plus, plus 2 squared over 1. That's 7. Okay, uh, what is the next one? Yeah, great, that's correct. 23, what is the next one? Fifty-nine. 59, yeah, that's correct. Uh, that's impressive. So, okay, uh, if you see anything unusual, let me know. Uh, if not, let me know what what the next one's gonna be. Oh, great! Wow, <laughs> yeah, I was not expecting that to be so fast. Yeah, that that is the correct answer. So, what's what's the next number, by the way? Seven times fifty nine plus twenty three squared over uh, three. Um, anybody? Three one four, good. Right, so so far it's not uh, like very obvious. Right, you divide by three, but then it's it, it's divisible. You add up a bunch of numbers, and the next one is going to be x ten, uh, twenty three times three fourteen, plus fifty nine squared over seven. Um, yeah, actually I have the sequence right here. The next one is 1529. And as I keep going, uh, I'm going to be divided by some kind of big prime numbers. Uh, like, yeah, so not for, exam for example, the next one. What is it? 59 times 1529 
plus 314 squared over 23, uh, which is what? 8209. So uh, you can see that none of these individual terms is divisible by 23. And yet somehow they combine together to, be, to form something that's divisible by 23. And okay, let me just uh, record this observation. So you can see that the sequence keeps, keeps growing pretty fast and then, so let me write down that's gonna be the first property that's true for all cluster algebras, uh, which so, so far it's gonna be not the official property, I'm gonna call it property one prime, which is gonna be that these, we're getting integers, even though this is unexpected because we divide by large prime numbers. Okay, now uh, let me try to show you some other example, which is called uh, freeze patterns. These are all gonna be examples of cluster algebras. So this is called Conway, Coxeter, freeze patterns. And so mm, what is a freeze pattern? First of all, yeah, these are also called SL2 freeze patterns. And let me remind you that SL2 is the group of two by two matrices with whose determinant is equal to one. AD minus BC is equal to one. And what is an SL2 freeze pattern? Well, here is, I have a, let me have a screenshot from a paper of Coxter about freeze patterns from the, from 71. And yeah, he, he starts by just saying that it's best explained by an example. And so here's an example of a, here's an example of a freeze pattern. And so, what are the conditions? Conditions are very simple. So an SL2 freeze pattern of order of order n uh, uh, right, yeah, that's, so that's basically the condition. So I guess, I guess there are some extra conditions that you, you're supposed to have two rows of ones. Uh, but basically it's, it's an array that consists of n minus one rows, the top and the bottom rows. Bottom rows consist of ones, all ones, and then the the crucial SL two condition, SL two condition, is that for every diamond, uh, like, uh, let me write it down like this: A, B, C, D. For any diamond like this, I have the condition that AD minus BC is equal to one. I have it here, yeah, great. Um, yeah, and so, uh, well, I mean, it, uh, in this case, these are all integers. In general, we could plug in real numbers or complex numbers, yeah. But these all actually, it's again, as you're already familiar with this phenomenon, these are all integers, which, I mean, I haven't explained to you why I mean, th in this particular pattern, they're all integers, but what's the general phenomenon? I haven't told you yet. Um, but uh, as I said, it's specific to all cluster algebras. You always get kind of integers. Um, okay, so, but let me, let me try to mention some other property that's also pretty remarkable, which is if you look at this, freeze pattern, what you're gonna see is that, uh, let me try to draw a triangle. Okay, this is gonna be hard. Yeah, let me even try to do this, okay. 
I go like this. I take this triangle and then I'm going to take adjacent triangle like this. What, what do you see? Hmm? Say it again. Yeah. Right. So uh, great. Thank you. So indeed, this triangle here is obtained from this triangle here by kind of reflecting. And this is called a glide reflection, where you reflect and then you shift the triangle. And then the next one. as you can see, is going to be just the shifted, uh, another shifted reflected version of the same triangle. And so this is true in general. So theorem. The theorem is that uh, any SL2 freeze pattern of order n is n periodic. We can try some other. Uh, if you think I'm cheating, I'm giving you some kind of uh, free defined example. Let me let me try an arbitrary example, which I'm also going to. Uh, so let's say I choose. I put a row of ones. And then, I don't know, maybe some other row of ones. And then I'm going to choose some, maybe some initial conditions like this. Um, I don't know, something like this. Um, and then I'm going to try to uh, try to compute the rest of the entries from these initial conditions. And uh, as you remember, the condition is that for any diam diamond A, B, C, D, I'm going to get the determinant AD minus BC is equal to 1, which is the same as D is equal to 1 plus BC over A. Right, so once I know kind of three entries of a diamond, I can compute the fourth one using this recurrence relation. And so if I look at this pattern, then you know I have 1, 1, 1, so the entry here is going to be 1 times 1 plus 1 over 1. So that's like a 2. And then this is also going to be a 2. And then the entry here is going to be 2 times 2 plus 1 over 1. And that's 5. And then here I'm going to get 5 plus 1 over 2. That's a 3. A 3 here. And then 9 plus 1 over 5. That's 2. So you see I'm getting integers unexpectedly. 9 plus 1 is divisible by 5. Okay, and then 2 plus 1 over 3, that's 1, 1. And again, I'm getting these, I'm getting these triangles, which are going to be mirrors of each other. Let's see if I can do some more. Uh, 1 plus 1 over 1 over 2, that's 1. 1 plus 1 over 1, that's 2. 1 plus 1 over 1, that's... Wait, what? Uh, am I doing something wrong? Yeah, I'm doing something wrong. Yes, thank you. Right, that's that's correct. Let me try to do some, to use some technology. Nice. Uh, okay, so let me try one more time. Okay, this triangle is supposed to be the same as the other triangle. Okay, 2, 2. Mm, yeah, I think it's going to... Wait, why is it... No, I'm not doing it right. Am I doing it right? Okay, yeah, the, oh, all right, yeah, that's true. Okay, 3, 3, uh, 9... 10 or, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, so it works in two examples. And it, the theorem is that 
Right, and, and uh, you see that, okay, so an important part is that the order of an SL2 freeze pattern is the number of rows plus one. So in this case, I have like one, two, three, four, five rows. So I have to shift my triangle by one, two, three, four, five, and one, two, three, four, five. Am I not doing it right again? Oh, sorry, yes. So it has five rows. So the order is six. And therefore I have to six by I have to shift by one, two, three, four, five, six steps. Okay. Um, so and that's gonna be that's gonna be some phenomenon that lied uh, at the origin of class cluster algebras. Uh, let me write down this is going to be property number two, which is going to be, I'm going to call it periodicity. Or even, or half periodicity. Where half periodicity means that, you know, there is, instead of just shifting your triangle, n steps to the right, there is, an, there is a stronger statement, which is that there's something in the middle that you can apply, operation you can apply twice, and then you, you're gonna get periodicity from that. Okay, mm. should I say anything else? Uh, any questions so far? All right. Um, let me let me now explain what do I mean by the property of these of these numbers being integers. Clearly, I can I can start with some non-integer values. Like if 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 this guy is a seven, then I'm gonna get two over seven. Like this is not gonna be an integer. So I have to choose my initial conditions carefully. And so the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to introduce clusters. So cluster as in cluster algebra. So here's the definition. Uh, some basically, I want to say that uh, what I want to say is that uh, these ones here form a cluster. So a cluster is going to be some kind of a path a lattice path that goes uh, from the top boundary to the bottom boundary and then it every time it, it goes either down right or down left. And similarly in this picture here there was a cluster which went like this. Okay, so let me write down an exact definition the entries of a freeze pattern of an SL2 freeze pattern uh, form a cluster which is I mean it, it's kind of a stupid definition right now but later it's going to become it's going to make more sense uh, if they lie on a lattice path Connecting top boundary to the bottom boundary uh, with every steps, with all the steps being down left or down right. And so Uh, uh, so, so, so far I'm talking about positions in a kind of, in this array, right? So, uh, what I'm gonna, like from here, I chose them all to be ones, but later on I'm gonna choose them to be just ar arbitrary variables. Right? But so far, these are all, well, okay, so let me, let me state a, a theorem. Well, okay, so I guess the first, uh, proposition is that, uh, 
if all values in a cluster are equal to one, then uh, the rest uh, is determined uniquely um, and all entries are integers. Okay, now, uh, now let me try to see what happens in general. So if, if these are not ones, but just some arbitrary variables. Let me hide this for a little bit. So uh, let's say I choose a row of ones and some other some other row of ones and let let's say i start with i choose some cluster and let's say i start with some variables instead of the ones and then i keep going right so remember the formula is the formula is here so what i'm going to do is i'm going to get 1 plus 1 plus b over a here and then this is going to be uh, what is going to be b plus 1 over a plus 1 over b, which is a plus b plus 1 over a b. Okay, and now what do I put here? That's actually interesting. So I'm supposed to write a plus b plus 1 over a b plus 1 over b plus 1 over a, right? And then, uh, okay, I, I can do the algebra. a b plus a plus b plus 1 over uh, b plus 1 times b, right? And so, as you can see, what happens is that the sum factors, it's a, a plus 1 times b plus 1. So b, the b plus 1 cancels out, and I just get a plus 1 over b. And now if I do this one more time, a plus 1 over b plus 1 over a plus b plus 1 over a b, what I'm going to get is, again, there's going to be a cancellation. Right? Uh, so I'm going to get, hopefully, is going to be equal to a. Is that right? This is going to be a, and this is going to be a plus 1, over, and this is going to be b. So, and, and then the whole procedure is going to repeat itself in a mirrored way. Does it, does it make sense? Right. So, as you can see, uh, there are denominators. There's a and b and a, b. So if I set a and b to be just arbitrary 5 and 7, then I'm going to get denominators in general. Um, but yet, somehow, if a, if a and b are all equal to 1, then all these denominators are just going to be equal to 1, because they're all single monomials, which is unexpected. Right? There was some consolation, there were some non-trivial factors going on, which canceled out with the denominator. So let me now state the actual famous property of cluster algebras. So uh, let me remind you that a Laurent polynomial is basically a is a polynomial divided by a monomial. And and then the theorem is that theorem is that all entries of an SL2 freeze pattern pattern are Laurent polynomials in uh, in what I'm gonna call 
in the cluster variables. All right, so, okay, by cluster variables, I mean choose a cluster and denote its elements by some variables. These are your, so these A and B are my cluster variables. And you can see that the rest of the entries of the Fritz pattern are not just arbitrary rational functions, but actual Laurent polynomials. So this theorem is called, uh, this is called the Laurent phenomenon. And I guess this is the, so remember the first, the property one prime was that we're getting integers. Well, the actual property, property one is that the entries are Laurent polynomials in the cluster variables. And similarly, let me, um, yeah, let me go back to the, to my original sequence here, right? So this is called, by the way, this is called the Samus 4 sequence. So uh, for the Samus 4 sequence, of course, I chose the initial conditions to be all equal to one, but in general, you can write down every entry as a rational function in x0, x1, x2, and x3. And what's gonna happen is a similar kind of cancellation. For the sum of four sequence, all entries are Laurent polynomials in x0, x1, x2, and x3. And so these are somehow gonna be my cluster variables. And that's also a theorem. Uh, no, not usually. Uh, I, I don't remember if, if in this particular, uh, well, oh, you're saying Monic. Right, yeah, yeah, in this case, it, it is Monic, yeah, yeah, that's always true. But it's, it's not what I'm, it's not always gonna have just, it's not gonna be square free, is what I'm saying. Sometimes you're gonna get degrees in, in the denominator. Okay. Mm. Uh, yes, it, um, I mean, technically it, it is, but uh, yeah, I guess, uh, I guess part of this theorem is what I'm saying is that the denominator is going to have a coefficient of one. Yes. So, uh, in particular, when you plug in all ones in all cluster algebras, you are going to see integers right away. Yeah, but thanks. Yeah, that, that's a good that's a good observation. Uh, okay. Now let me. Uh, I guess I'm I'm supposed to tell you one other surprising property of. Uh, of cluster algebras. Let me just copy this theorem and add something to it. So our Laurent polynomials, um, let me write uh, with positive, with positive integer coefficients. So, um, in the cluster variables. And the non-trivial part, well, I, mean, I guess both of these are non-trivial, but the hard part of this is positive coefficients. Right. So when you plug in all ones, you actually get positive integers. 
And so let me try to explain why this is, let me try to discuss whether this is trivial or, no, or non-trivial. So, but let me first write down so the third property of all cl cluster algebras, uh, property number three is positivity. All your Laurent polynomials have positive integer coefficients. And so, okay, how, why would this property be obvious to somebody? Uh, well, let me try to prove it to you and then see if my proof is okay. So let me make a definition. Let me say that a, uh, we're gonna use this a lot. So some subtraction, subtraction, free expression. Uh, it's basically an expression. It's like a rational function, which is not using the minus sign. Is a ratio of two polynomials with positive coefficients. Or in other words, it's like any, exp any polynomial, any expression you can obtain by, you're allowed to add things up, d divide one by another or multiply, but you're not allowed to subtract one from the other. And so, Okay, and so the claim is that, uh, which is also going to be true for all cluster algebras, is that uh, all entries of a freeze pattern or of the or of the SAMAS four sequence. are subtraction free expressions in the cluster variables. Uh, is this is this easy or hard? Great, yeah, thank you. That is that is true. So proof, if you look at the recurrence, like for example this one, there is no minus sign. Uh, xn plus 4 equals to xn plus 1, xn plus 3 plus xn plus 2 squared over xn is subtraction free. And the same is true, well, for the for the diamond A, B, C, D, the recurrence was that D was equal to 1 plus B, C over A, and therefore, well, this is also, also subtraction free. So uh, as you iterate these recurrences, you're never getting any minus signs. And therefore, if you start with like positive real values, you're gonna get positive real values everywhere. Okay, so uh, question, does this imply positivity of coefficients of our Laurent polynomials? So let me write it in another way. So the same question, but uh, more rigorously written as well. So let's say I have P, Q, and R are just some polynomials. Let me write it down. Uh, this, let's say, polynom even not in Laurent, just polynomials in some variables, x1 through xm. Uh, and suppose they satisfy that P divided by Q so P is divisible by Q, and the result is another polynomial R. And let's say P and Q have 
positive coefficients. Does it, does it follow that uh, R has positive coefficients as well? X squared plus X plus one. Huh. Okay, it is X squared minus one or something like that. Uh, wait, what's gonna be? X squared minus X plus one. Huh, okay. Three fourths. Right, but yeah, right, so the example uh, that I am capable of computing myself is something like this. Right. Squared minus x y plus y squared. Yeah. So, so the answer to this question is no. It is not enough to make sure. Not every subtraction free rational function is gives you a positive Laurent polynomial, even if it's a Laurent polynomial as well. Right. So. Uh, in principle, it could happen that I'm, as I'm kind of computing these Laurent polynomials here, I, I'm doing some consolations, and then I may encounter negative values. But it turns out that it never happens. And that was a, like a conjecture for 20 years or something like that, or 15 years, let's say. It was recently con confirmed for all cluster algebras by Gross, Hack, and Keel, and Konsevich using some kind of ideas from physics or string theory, things like that. Um, okay. Um, uh, well, basically, well, I can say some words, but uh, since I don't know string theory, well, the, w the relevant words are um, mirror symmetry and wall crossing yeah, that's that's basically it. So there are some, there are some kind of wall crossing diagrams which give you interpretations for these coefficients which are non-negative integers. Okay, any other questions? Uh, well, you can you can do at least you can do general SLN. Right, you can you can uh, impose the condition that in your freeze pattern, like any three by three determinant is equal to one. So that has been studied, and there are some kind of similar nice, you know, there's some linear occurrences going on. Yeah, so you can. In in fact, you can you can make these arrays three dimensional, and then every next layer, the first layer is going to be SL two, the next one SL three, and etc. I don't know about other Lie groups. I have to think about it. But, well, okay, so one. Uh, I guess there is one analog. We're going to study cluster algebras of finite type. And those correspond to uh, Dinkin diagrams, which correspond to Lie groups. And you, you can make a similar construction for arbitrary, like finite type cluster algebra. But uh, in, in this case, this is going to be, uh, yeah, anyways, I, I'm going to return to this later, but that's a good question. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, I think I have one minute left. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, I think I'm going to stop here. So. Thanks for tuning in. I will see you all on Wednesday. If you have any more questions, let me know. Otherwise, see you on Wednesday. <laughs>